Sister Elise Silvestri has agreed to talk with us today about her work with the Immigrant and Refugee Women's Program. We're very interested, Sister Elise, to hear about your background, how you found this unmet need, and what prompted you to action. Thank you for joining us today. Very happy to be here. Well, I'll start by telling you that at the time I had done a lot of parish work and I was looking for something else to do, something different. And I read a newspaper article. There was a picture of Sister Paulette Windell, a precious blood sister who was doing ministry at St. Pius V Church on Grand Avenue. It was a picture of her and her assistant at that time who were working with Vietnamese refugees. Lady Justice is blindfolded and everybody is created equal under the law. I take issue with that also because I know that it's not always true. We can't accept everybody, but who do we accept and who do we reject? And I think that goes along with um, the, the um, heart of religious life. You know, when we, all the changes we've gone through since the 60s and our, our change of focus on justice and op option for the poor, we, we, our awareness has certainly uh, become much greater and more sensitive. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless tempest toss to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. So I went to Sister Paulette, I met with her and I asked her about her ministry with the Vietnamese. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. It touched a core in me because my father was an immigrant and he never really, while he studied English at night after working, um, he never lost his accent and he felt very uncomfortable with that. So what I did was I set up a, an appointment with Sister Paulette. This was way back in 1995. And so what she said was, why don't you come over Sunday afternoon at the convent? Because the sisters there had opened their house to all the Vietnamese women and their daughters who were like grade school, upper grade school and high school and they were holding English classes over there. So I went over there and I saw what a big group it was. And I thought, I don't know if I could do that kind of thing. The more she talked, the more I realized what she was doing was more social work. And of course, as a teacher, I wanted to teach. So I said to her, is it possible that we could do a one-on-one -on -one where I could work with one woman at a time so that she could really learn English and then do a number of women uh, because I would not be working in parish work anymore and I could make a ministry out of this. Well, she said yes. So we talked to the women one evening at one woman's apartment. The room was full because we had about 10 women there. We had a wonderful conversation and I said, I've been thinking about this. Um, I know you have to work and some of you are, uh, do not have a husband. And so you have to work during the day. Um, I would be willing to come individually to your house that's to any of the women. And we could set up a program for each of you, depending on what your need is as far as 
English goes. Well, they were very excited about the idea. When I started this, it was very informal. We set up a schedule, whose home I would go to. If someone was working during the day, I would meet them in the evening at their home. I would get to know them a little, and we would work on English. And that was the beginning of the one-on-one. -on -one. I had very rudimentary material to work with, but they were very happy, since they had a chance to get to know me a little bit, they were very happy just to have me come, and I spent time looking around for material that I could use to start them wherever they were. All of the women knew a little English. At least I could understand them and they could understand me. I could have done the group, but I found out through them and through other women that I worked with, the one-on-one -on -one is an excellent way to teach them English because you are working with her particular needs. And they would tell me they're afraid to go out. They don't, they don't know how to deal with meeting people on the street. They really didn't know how to speak English at work if they were working. Um, they just did whatever menial tasks they were given at work. If she wanted to learn because she had to go to the doctor and she didn't know how to talk to the doctor, she didn't know how to fill out the form when you get to the doctor's office, or even going to the store, she didn't know the names of things. It took her extra long to run through all the aisles and look at the food that she wants. So whatever her reason was, we started from that aspect. I approached the learning of English from her viewpoint. Maybe it's time we went to the store together. Okay, let's go to the store and you pick out what you want, but we've already studied fruits and vegetables, so you have to tell me what you want by English. I think an interesting thing as I think back on it is, my mother was hard of hearing. And so I learned that you have to look directly at mom, speak slower and more distinctly so she could understand what I was saying. It's incredible, but that was a very big help in working with refugees. Um, you don't slow down the rate too much because you need to speak just like they're going to hear anybody else on the street. Um, but they were very comfortable then, very comfortable and no longer afraid because I was coming to their home. They didn't have to leave their home. That was the first group of refugees in St. Louis during my time. And through the network at International Institute, we all belong to the, uh, the group. Anybody who worked with refugees, we would meet once a month. So we're talking about uh, nurses, uh, social workers, uh, anybody involved with uh, refugees at the time. So, we would meet and we would discuss what needed to be done. We discussed what was happening with the refugee program in the United States. And then came the flood of refugees from many, many countries where there was war. Um, I, I don't even remember after Vietnam, I think it was Somali, Eritreans, Ethiopians. In just a few years, I think we were working with uh, people from 10, 15 different cultures. And that meant, of course, that I had to get volunteers 
So that was the next stage of what I had to do. So I put out notices and parish bulletins saying, this is what I need. Uh, you have to want to come to the woman's home. And a lot of people didn't want to do that. But those that did, I had incredible teachers. Just women really uh, wanting to do something to help the, the new refugees that were coming in. Mostly refugees at that time. So then I had to do uh, teacher in services. And it was very, I enjoyed those. I really enjoyed working with the teachers. Every time we had a meeting, we would talk about something else that was very important about the way they presented themselves. A lot of my training for the women was cultural training. I said, you must first, before I give you a student, you must first read about this particular culture that I'm thinking of, uh, the woman for you. Read about it so that you understand the kind of background she comes from. And if there was a war, which there was a war, you go back, you find out about that war, how were women and children affected by that? Not that you talk about it, unless she brings it up. But oftentimes the women were scared, you know? So always I, they knew me, so I would tell them, I have a teacher for you and I'm gonna bring her on this day. And so I would bring her and because I brought her, they would trust the teacher because they trusted me. And I always went back at least once a month to check how things were, do were going I, of course, checked with the teacher. I was always up on what's going on, how comfortable they feel, are there any situations or problems that have come up that I could help you with, about how they encourage the women. At the end of the class, that they would tell the women, look what you learned today, so that every day, the more there was this connection, woman to woman, the more comfortable the women felt. So really, that's the bulk of how we got started. The bond that happened almost every single time was just so heartwarming to me because once she felt comfortable with her teacher, she took off, she could learn. And then she was so proud because the teacher would say, look what you've learned down the line. And I just had incredible teachers. I, I can't say enough about them. Incredibly dedicated to helping one woman at a time. And for your information, this is the 25th anniversary of the Immigrant and Refugee Women's Program. I just found that out thought about it this past year um, and we're very happy about that. You mentioned that it is the 25th anniversary of the program. Yes. And um, how active are you in the program now? It sounds like you did a lot of networking with other organizations. How, what, how does that program continue to serve women and, and who is um, helping it grow? The person who took over after me was um, uh, much more qualified for beginning a program and for carrying it on. She knew how to uh, get donations and how to appeal to different groups, much better than I. So of course the money was building up and the more advertising you do, the more volunteers you got. So today, you know, I don't even know. I checked the website a couple months ago. I think they have more than a thousand students uh, and I don't know how many teachers, but it, and they've opened it up to men, but they still call it the Immigrant and Refugee Women's Program because 
we were incorporated like shortly after I left. We were working on incorporation. And the in-home model is still being followed? Absolutely. And it's still one-on-one. -on -one. Now I can tell you the kind of stories we ran into, I mean, things that happened. My big thing was to build up the woman's confidence that she could do this, that she could go walk the street, go down to the store, and even how to take care of herself so that nobody would uh, interfere with her. Uh, but to how to go to the doctor, whatever she wanted, that was the first thing she learned. From then on, it was A, B, C, D, and mixing all the, the learning things. And then I, uh, I had gone for uh, graduate work with Sister Barb Bitter. And Barb Bitter was a reading specialist. And oh my goodness, I, I saw what she could do. And I said, Barb, you have to come help us because the longer we go, the more we want to put this program into a form that anybody can pick up and do it. And so Barb was so instrumental in our putting together the handbook for the teachers, which was marvelous, just marvelous. I met a lot of students at the International Festival in August and some of them had booths, food booths, of course. And of course I went to get their food. And of course I didn't have to pay anything for it because they liked what I did. <laughs> so that was, it was just fun meeting up with them on the street or certainly at the International Festival. Sister, other than free food at the festival, what would you say is the biggest, um, blessing or gift that you got through this work? Oh, that's a, that's a wonderful question. Um, the blessing to me was to see them grow. I could actually see them grow in confidence. And part of it, part of my reason again for, for doing this was when refugees come to the country, uh, they go to someplace like the International Institute. The man goes for two months. Uh, he gets enough English to get a job. The children right away go to school. So he's learning English on the job. The children are learning English in school. And who's home by herself afraid to go out but the mother. So for me, empowering women to stand on their own two feet, to learn what they needed to learn, to move around this culture, which is so often very, very different from their own culture. Uh, that to me has been a blessing. It's so much a part of who we are as School Sisters of Notre Dame. It's so much a part of our charism. Uh, so I just say again, of all the things that I've done, and I've done wonderful things that I enjoyed, but nothing like this, because it, it touched me personally. Well, Sister Elise, thank you so much for sharing this story with us, and we wish you well in whatever your next adventure is, and hope to keep up with what's going on with the Immigrant and Refugee Women's Program. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. We'll be celebrating shortly. Great. Great. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye.